Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign, and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talked to Nick from Scum Media. I last had a conversation with Nick six months ago, so we catch up on everything from media censorship to where the freedom movement is now and where to go from here to build this new subculture. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Nick, thanks so much for coming on. We first spoke to each other on Thomas Barden Rice's uh, YouTube channel, which I definitely recommend that people check out for kind of similar conversations on um, where things are going with the freedom movement. Uh, but it's been a while since we've last talked. I think last time was probably around six or so months ago. So uh, how's things going your end? Is that long ago? Like I've got no sense of time since uh, since this all kicked off about two years ago. It's very, very confusing, like uh, remembering what happened when. Uh, in my personal life, I've got a fairly good memory of like what measures were brought in when and what the narrative did at what point. But like, yeah, there's been because it's been so Groundhog Day. I don't know. It's it's all kind of mushed. I do feel like that's kind of ending though, and I can see yeah, maybe it's not the old normal coming back, but I can see some sort of normality resuming at least in my own life they're they're trying to push it the other way and they will continue but um i don't know i can see it, it took a while to like find other people that feel the same way but that seems to be a sort of snowball effect and now i'm actually spending a lot of time with people that get it and we're planning stuff together more importantly so um so i'm good i'm looking forward to 2022 um like i really am um, because I've had enough of this nonsense. Uh, how about you? Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I also feel strangely positive recently. I was not expecting to feel this positive so early on. I mean, when we last talked, I think I was probably a bit more on the side of, okay, this is probably going to be for the next decade, something that we're going to be dealing with. And actually, I now think that it's coming to crunch time quite soon and I think that people's patience is running out and actually a lot more people honestly what it is for me is the um it's the booster thing the booster thing has really kicked a lot of people onto our team quite early on in this um struggle I guess you could call it and I think that that's made a lot more people awake who otherwise um you know might not have been if they hadn't have pulled this whole booster stunt but I really think they've made a mistake there uh, honestly I don't know how you feel about that yeah, I think there's a few factors. It's um, it's interesting when we're talking about this because this is the first time in a while that they've tried to introduce something for everyone again, which is like mandatory masks in shops. Um, I think it's shops and maybe some other places, uh, which obviously I'm not going to do. No one who thinks like me is going to do. And a lot of people won't do it, even though it's quote unquote mandatory. I have heard that in Scotland, where it is mandatory, you can get a train that hurtles the whole way from England through Scotland. And as soon as you cross the border, there's an announcement saying, put your masks on and everyone does. So that tells you a lot. I mean, no one, no one believes it's about health. It's all about performance. Um, And I would hope that people would think, right, if I've had two, maybe three shots of this, then being asked to wear a mask again is ridiculous. You know, masks at this point are just for people who like wearing masks. And we've discovered that there's a lot of them, but that's all this is. If you want there to be restrictions, it's because you enjoy them at this point. Or if you advocate for any of them, like I think a deeper question um, than what should we do about the pandemic is like, how have we ended up with a media that's, this callous you know they're sat there waiting for the next variant so they can punish us with more fear and it's just happened um and i I think very few people believe it we're sort of the whole country's rolling its eyes at the omicron thing uh because what is there like two suspected cases of this or something and we're supposed to all put the face muzzles on again. Um, But I take a different approach to people that just like roll their eyes. I think this is really, really sick. 
I think uh, I don't know how you're going to cure the people that are hook, line and sinker for this. And anyone under 18, I'm really, really scared that they've had two years of this. So like the deeper question is, how do we even have a media that's willing to do this to people? Yeah, I honestly don't know how it has got that way. I kind of wrap my brains every day because the obvious answer that you might get from the average person kind of in the freedom movement or who is, you know, on top of this stuff, they would say, well, um, this is all to do with financing and, you know, this is kind of big pharma money and things like that. And honestly, I just, I'm just not sure it kind of explains it. I mean, for instance, the BBC is probably um, the most extreme example of this of any. And they are funded by the, um, not the taxpayer, but essentially the license fee in the UK. Um, and they're probably the worst of anyone. And um, yes, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did give them um, some money. I believe they gave them something like £1 million for something at some point, the BBC. BBC Media Trust, I believe it was. But it, that is nothing, you know, in the, in the scale of, um, you know, people allocating money to media institutions. This is very, very small amount of money. I just can't imagine that really tipping the scales too much. So in, the, in terms of our media in the UK, it really surprised me that um, we still have such a biased media. What, do you have a theory on it? Um, I mean, are you familiar with the NRX Cathedral framework? No, not at all. That doesn't mean anything to you. Okay, well, it's basically the idea that, like, um, institutions, the media, uh, politics, and I think there's another wing of it, I'm not an expert, uh, but they're self-perpetuating systems that will always tend towards, um, I don't know if you'd phrase it, the left or communism. Um, but yeah, it, it, it selects for itself in this way. So if someone goes against the grain, they just get sort of spat out by the system. And you see this at the moment with like a couple of MPs um, who are against the vaccine passports, but they're almost like a laughing stock because they're, there's like five of them um, and they're just not part of the pack really, because the system doesn't work in that way. The system's going in another direction. Um, as for the BBC, like it became a real villain to me after the Brexit referendum, because like I'm not really an ideologue in, or I wasn't until um, they took all our freedom away. And now I guess I am. I'm incredibly pro-freedom. Um, but what I really noticed after the referendum was that the majority who voted in that vote voted to leave the European Union and the BBC specifically led the charge in branding the country wrong, thick, racist, um, all of this other stuff. The BBC was this self-appointed expert that was platforming all the experts. And it was, uh, yeah, it's the callousness. It was the way that it berated the public for voting the wrong way. It was trying to make them think they were thick. It wasn't a balanced discussion of what was going on at all. It told the public that they picked the wrong direction. And that to me is really, really shocking because if it's the license fee payer, it's supposed to be representing the British people. So it can't just tell the British people that they're wrong. Like how, how does that work? What is this thing? Um, I am no expert on the history of the BBC, but I do know about that statue out the front of it. Do you know about the statue? Now, what does it say? Oh, it's not what it says. It's what it is. Uh, there's a statue carved by oh, Eric a st Dill. Oh, a statue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought, I thought you said statute. No, no, no. It's the, it's the rather nasty statue of a, of a naked young child that's outside the BBC offices. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, no. It, it, yeah, it's worse than that. So there's a... There's a young naked boy who's sort of bound by an adult he's been kept prisoner um but the sculptor was a pedophile that's that's confirmed um yeah that checks out yeah and his statues were removed from many many other places when this came out but not that building um and with what we know about savile and how it intersects with knighthood and all of this other stuff. The history of the BBC looks to be dark in the long term. It, I don't think this is a runaway problem that's um, only just emerged. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of the the Brexit stuff, like I, I don't know if I told you in our 
in one of our previous conversations, but I was a Remainer. And now I would probably say that I am, I would, I don't know how I would vote. I would, I would probably either not vote if it, there was a, a revote or I would probably be um, more on the leave side. But um, I certainly agree that BBC's coverage was just awful. I mean, it was almost like rather than saying, okay, this is the way the British people have voted. This is the will of the British people. It was like, how has th- how have things gone so wrong? How has the country gone so wrong that people have voted for this? You know, it was like it was like, what must we do to correct these people who have voted this way? It was uh, yeah, very very biased stuff. Yeah, that's interesting because I voted to remain at the time, but my instant reaction, and I don't know if this is why I've reacted the same way to the COVID stuff, um, was to go, okay, what did I get wrong? Because I'd presumed, and you probably have as well, that um, the country is going to vote Remain and we're going to remain. And that's what was up. Um, And so when it happened, there there was one book, I can't remember what it was called, maybe the Anywheres and the Somewheres. That was the theme of it. But it was trying to break down the demographics of the the vote and explain the different concerns of um, of the two groups. Because that's what I wanted to get a handle on beyond these people are wrong because they can't be wrong. For, if we have democracy and we believe in democracy, then it can't be wrong. You have to understand why it happened, even if you don't agree with it. And I went and did the, the same basic thing with Trump, which was when that happened, I was like, OK, um, I've missed something here because I've been reading The Guardian and it's told me that only an idiot would think of voting for this person and yet he's in. So what was this about? And just went and tried to tried to find out what it was about and actually it was perfectly reasonable if you just look at it from another side. As for Brexit right now, I've got, I went from you know sort of a sleep remainer to really hard Brexiteer um and now i couldn't care less anyone talking about brexit is just missing the trick because my one of my main reasons for opposing it was because it's a big bureaucracy and it's like and it's national sovereignty is good power in the hands of the people is good yeah it it really doesn't matter to me at this point whether or not we're in the eu because we seem to be taking all our orders from the who and the un and and huge one world bodies. So the EU has become a bit of an irrelevance to me and I can't stand the, the sort of pro Brexit wing who are really like, who are still in this fight. It means nothing to me. Yeah. I mean, I thought about this because my main reason for remaining in the EU was freedom of movement. That was really the, the, the main thing. I didn't actually care about almost anything else. Like it was purely that I wanted the ability to leave, live in different areas. So I guess it was from some kind of libertarian standpoint that I was doing it, whereas I was not seeing the other side of that, which is that, um, you know, actually having more local democracy and, you know, things like that is actually, you know, mo- local representation, these kind of things are important and national sovereignty are important. But for me, I was just like, I want to be able to live in any of these nation states and I believe in the free movement of people and things, which I still do. Um, and I actually thought when this happened... For instance, you look at what's happening in the United States, that when all of this has happened with COVID and all the states have taken different approaches to it, you've got people generally moving from blue states to red states, right? You've got people moving from California to Texas or from uh, like New York to Florida, etc. Now, I kind of thought, well, this would be a great opportunity for the EU to present its um, advantages, whereby if some states go com- or some nations go completely um, you know, dystopian, like at the time, I was thinking the UK, you know, we were the most locked down country probably last year or one of the most. And you had Sweden, which was literally a short flight away. And I thought, God, if only we were still in the EU, I could just hop on a flight. I could go and live in Sweden. And uh, that would be the end of it. Whereas now, ironically, we're probably one of the most free, if not the most free um, nations in the whole of Europe right now. And we're not in the block. And all of the nations which are in the block are complete. Um, you know, on some scale of fascism, you know, um, prob- you've got some more than others, but certainly I would rather be here than almost any state, uh, sorry, nation state in Europe right now. That's interesting. I mean, has anyone, is there any data on people hopping between more or less fascistic states within Europe? I mean, 
I don't think it is the same as America. America is very interesting for that because it is all one nation with one language, which I think is probably the reason why people are less likely to hop around. It's, and under this like time of crisis, I think people do want to be nearer to their families um, and stuff like that. It's less likely that you're going to want to sort of risk it somewhere else because you don't know what's around the corner. Um, so... I don't know, but yeah, I haven't heard of any sort of exoduses from um, from one country to another. But I don't know if people have been allowed to. I think that's that's probably one of the most stringent rules, isn't it? Is um, crossing any kind of border, even within the EU. I'm pretty sure the EU borders have remained open, though. I'm not so sure it's so simple. I think they've got um, different rules on testing in different countries. Um, I know that my brother lives in switzerland and had to go to france for something and it sounded more complicated than it used to be did he fly or did he take the train no he was driving oh he was driving okay yeah i could be wrong about that but certainly um you have uh some right to move certainly more freedom to move within europe than you do for instance going from the uk now that we're out of the eu to an eu country and i'm wondering will that play out i think that probably the test for that will be next April, when the kind of mandated vaccines come into Australia, uh, sorry, to Austria, I imagine that there will be people who leave Austria and they naturally, the most obvious thing for them to do would be to go to another EU state that doesn't, an, sorry, an EU nation state, which does not have that um, that mandate. So I, I think that that will probably be a big test for whether the EU is going to function kind of like the United States or whether people are just going to have nowhere to go or because, yeah, I, I don't know how that will actually pan out, to be honest. I mean, who knows how Austria is going to pan out? From what I heard, it was 35% of the population were unjabbed as it stands. Um, you, you can't fine or lock up 35% of the population. You can't do anything to 35% of the population without your country falling apart. So to me, that looks like a bluff to get people over the line, which is all any of these mandates are. This is a really interesting thing about travel as you've described it because you've been to another country and back before this um during this madness um and i've got a friend who hops from one country to another on an almost weekly basis and never wears a mask and never done a test and all of this stuff so and, and what it proves is that this is all just a sort of test of will and whether airlines are going to care more about their bottom line or about looking like they're doing the right thing. And like, ultimately they are still businesses and that's where I'm hoping that we're, we're going to succeed. It's, it's very, very strange because all any business needs to do is just say, stuff it. No. And they don't even have to be particularly loud about it. They can just continue operating as they always did. And I think a huge amount of the world is just doing this. Um, but then we do need people to like kind of make an example of it. You, you're following the um, cinema in Swansea, I presume. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, like it's wonderful and heartwarming to see all the support from our side and they managed to raise 50 grand in 24 hours and the, and the place is like jam-packed all the time with supporters but what scares me is it's the only one i've heard of in wales like there's one business in wales um and that really scares me about the number of people that are willing to do something yeah i agree that is it is disappointing to not see more businesses standing up um but it always starts with one. You know, we have to remember this, a similar thing happened last year. Um, you know, we had the gym in Liverpool, which was the only one. And then that spread to many gyms in Liverpool. A similar thing happened in New York and New Jersey in the United States. And it was one gym and then it was two and then it was four and then it was eight. And um, I do think that it just takes one. So I'm not too dissuaded by that because if anything, if you just have one, which is um, standing up, the amount of, all of the support will be funneled to that one um, kind of point that will be just you know the kind of one area that everything gets concentrated to and then other businesses I'm sure will look at that I'm I'm sure there's other businesses that have seen what's happened to this uh, cinema I think it's called Cinema and Co right yeah that's right yeah I'm sure there's other businesses that are probably looking at that saying hey you know what like we we don't want to um, be enforcing these measures 
but we didn't think we were going to get any any support. But I've now seen what this business is getting, and uh, you know maybe they won't feel so kind of alone um, if they were to go ahead and and say no, we're not going to enforce them. Well, I have an I have an unfortunate report from down on the ground in Wales. Um, there's a friend of mine. Uh, I was bullying her that she has to like get tested or show the pass to go out. And she said, no, 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 no one's checking it. It's fine. I did, I did do a test before going out, but no one checked it on the door. And, and this is the big problem for me. I mean, it's a huge problem that manifests in so many ways. There were people last year, also I suppose this year, this summer, um, faking tests to get into places and, and saying that to me saying like, Oh, don't worry. You can just fake a test and go in. It's like, that's part of my principle just as much as like not getting the jab. I'm not going to fake a test. I'm not going to contribute to your, your thing because it all perpetuates it. And, um, venues opening and not checking the COVID pass, but not doing what cinema and co are doing and saying it publicly and putting a poster in the, in the window, like mm, that's really damaging. We have a pandemic of cowardice, man. That's what's going on. Yeah. I totally agree with that. It's, it's tough though, because there are some things which are like very, very difficult to do. If you don't, a, a test is normally um, the minimum that you have to do. And I can kind of understand that, yeah, I, it's, it's hard to disagree with what you're saying, but at the same time, I would rather that than they all enforce them. It's like, it's like the middle ground, but I agree that they need to stand up and actually be counted and say, no, we're not going to just um, do this all as some ridiculous charade. We're, we're either in or we're out. And ideally they say we're out, you know, we're not going to enforce them, et cetera. So yeah, I, I agree with you, but I also think that you're expecting maybe a much higher degree of kind of volition amongst people who aren't necessarily where we are. And I do think that they're getting there. But, you know, we must remember, I think that some people, they need to see a majority or a large minority doing something before they will go ahead with it. And we're still in the early days of this. So I think there's still time for this to happen. Yeah, it is a hugely dramatic change, isn't it? Everyone's been through a head spinning experience and um i guess people that will be listening to this and they're interested in the twitter circles that we've been operating on in i, th- I think we're kind of ready at this point um in the sense that okay the dust has settled the panic is over i think i know what's going on and i know which way to face now and like what i ought to be doing um whereas is the people you're talking about a uh, I mean, I do think the majority of the country is probably saying, yeah, it's bollocks at this point. It's got to be sat at around 70% by this point. Yeah, and this is the thing. I think that uh, as this thing progresses and as we keep moving into a new paradigm, because this is happening quite slowly, you know, it's happening over the courses of kind of months and years, this change might appear slower than what we want it to happen at. But it does appear to me that um, we are in a very different world right now than we were even when we last talked, maybe six months ago. Um, the amount of people who I think, you know, essentially it's no longer kind of controversial anymore to espouse the kind of views which we talk about and to say, you know, we're against lockdowns, we're against mass. I mean, now if you're for a lockdown, you're 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 crazy. Like that, that nobody now, I can't find anyone who supports another lockdown except for maybe a couple of, you know, BBC or whatever, you know, Good Morning Britain, they probably would love it, but... <laughs> not many people um with with masks you know people are generally okay with it i don't think that many people would be mask zealots you, they might wear them but they wouldn't be the ones saying hey wear a mask you know i doubt that, that would happen many places now so the needle's moving in the di- right direction is what i think um but you know this there's, there's obviously still room but i would agree with you um we are probably in maybe a small majority but i would say we probably are in a majority now of people who just want this to end they're done with it you know they went everyone went and got their two jabs and you know even the compliant even if the ones who didn't really want or know they didn't you know they knew they didn't need the two jabs they went and got the jabs regardless because they were like this is the route to freedom and i do feel like now that the rug has been pulled on that and they're told oh no you're now unjabbed and you've now got to take more jabs and you're on vaccine. I definitely feel like people have reached that point where they're like, enough, you know, uh, not everyone, you know, maybe 
just a small majority, but I would say more than 50% are in that position. Yeah, I would say this new scariant only serves to like undermine whatever position they could be wanting to take whatever, because they're trying to prove at the moment the efficacy of the vaccines. They're trying to prove that it was a good idea and that it was the way out of lockdown, because that's what the people that went for it were promised. It's like, you do this, you do your civic duty, and you can have all of your freedoms back. And now they come along with this new scariant and the government does what the government does and pays lip service to the horror of this one being more transmissible. And I really think everyone collectively is just looking at that and going, what? No, no, we can't. It's, it, it's like, it sounds all triumphant to say we're not going to live our lives in fear, but it's almost a resigned version of that. Like, no, we're not going to live our lives in fear because honestly, it's the boy who cried wolf. No one could be scared of this anymore because I think it was discovered on the other side of the world or something. There's just no proof that this is a threat. And, and this is why like, I'm so confident in our positions at this point. The damage that has been caused by this exercise is unthinkable. And, we're, and they're running around with blindfolds on. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Are these athletes going to now um, not be able to travel? Are they going to be kicked out of the league? Well, of course they're not, because the league has a lot of money and they want them to be able to travel and go around. And so this sports people could be, you know, this unlikely group of people, which actually... Um, has an impact on everyone else because they could end up being quite a central kind of pivotal um, piece on this chessboard. Yeah, I think they are a really important piece on this chessboard, um, footballers specifically, because it's so huge in the UK. You know, um, the top footballers are role models, whether they like it or not. And they're always reminded of that. And a lot of them, those that have taken the jab or promoted the jab, uh, were probably told that by their management that um, it's because people look up to you that you have to be shown to be responsible. Um, that's the kind of thinking that's in there. And and it's, I mean, it's obviously tragic uh, that this is happening left, right and centre, but it's, it's kind of the perfect industry for the dam to burst in um, because it's total normie fodder. Like, did do you see the footage of the football fans in their pens um, back in the oh, summer? I, I think I did see it, yeah. It was unbelievable. It made me despair for British men being like, oh, well, this is why we're not winning. And this is, look, look at that for compliance. Just men in their pens celebrating, throwing their pints in the air, but in such an orderly way. Um <laughs> You know, it felt, it felt very hopeless there. And there was also the double standard where, because um, this is something that really annoys me about the scandemic is people are bloody selfish. So the football fans should have noticed that everything else was banned when they were allowed to do what they wanted in crowds to 50,000 and the stadiums were open. There were still nightclubs and clubs and festivals and all of this stuff was still banned. Um, and... I just kind of wish the people that were on the positive end of double standards would occasionally notice the people that um, are still restricted. But if it's affecting their beautiful game, which it is, it, I mean, the dam has to burst on this one. These are the people that like were asleep and we had proof that they were asleep. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. The, qu the question is like, how do you wake people up when facts don't work? Yeah, I think that is a good question. I mean, that's, I guess, what we're all trying to do. And for me personally, the answer to that question is trying to speak to the people around you. And this is why I think that this movement is going to be decentralized at the end of the day, because I think we're all out there, you know, on Twitter and, you know, to some degree in our echo chamber, sharing facts and figures and information and observations and i think that ultimately if we do want to kind of wake people up 
it is going to be down to people talking to their own friends and their own fam- family and trying to do it in a way that gets the message across uh, that doesn't cause arguments and things. One of the things that I'm finding lately, for instance, and I'm, I'm sure you would have found the same, is that people just don't want to talk about it. And I don't really want to talk about it either. You know, I don't want to be having these conversations, but this is an absolutely pivotal point in history when we need people um, to resist and to actually not comply. So my approach, and it's one of the reasons that I kind of started this um, podcast, is that I thought, well, you know what, um, I can share these episodes with my friends and family, you know, they're my um, community, and they can kind of hear maybe a different side that they're not hearing, you know, maybe people are just tuning into the news every day. So it's my way of kind of communicating to the people around me. Um, and likewise, other people who have kind of come on here and had conversations with me, they might say, oh, hey, um, you know, to your to your friend or your your brother or your sister or parents or whoever it is and just say, hey, I was on this, uh, this podcast, uh, we had this conversation, do you want to hear it? And um, it just gives someone an opportunity to kind of listen into a conversation whilst not being um, it not being a direct confrontation with that person, right? So it's a kind of a way of saying, look, there is a different side to this. These are some of my ideas. I've shared it in this um, format and had a conversation about it, but it doesn't kind of have that um, potential to turn into an argument or whatever, what, like it sometimes does when you talk to these people. So that's why I think it, that things like podcasts and just getting off Twitter and getting off these other channels is actually really useful. So um, that's my approach. It's just one approach. There are many, but that's just, um, I, I think ultimately this will be a decentralized movement. We cannot expect um, that you're going to convert people you don't know. And equally, you can't expect that the media is going to do our job for us. We've got to go to our friends and family and try to gently bring them back to a place of, of rationality and reason. Mm, a localized approach. I think that's, um, that's very interesting because I've watched yeah, since referendum in 2016, I've just watched the the growth and the fall of various movements, and um, and like look at the messiah worship of people that still want Trump to come back, and you know that's that's really detrimental to anyone's thinking. And I really love the freedom movement because it is leaderless and it's remained leaderless. Um, it's just a load of people that agree, and there's a bunch of initiatives which contain like thousands of people like stand in the park. I, I can name the woman that started stand in the park in the UK, but that's only because I do what I do. The vast majority of the people that go to that have no idea who she is. Um, the together declaration is another example. Um, in fact, I'm not sure who's in charge of the together declaration, but I know it's got over a hundred thousand people um, that have signed it. And e- even if I was to, to go right, right. Who is the leader? Who, who's got? Who's in the top position? Like the person who does the most outreach and activism and hectoring is Piers Corbyn, but half the movement believes that he's a controlled shill. So, it, it, is he the leader, or does someone have him beat? It, no, it's it's leaderless, and um, it it made it marked a really good point in my life this year when um, I got a leaflet through my door for my local stand in the park, which is only three three minutes away from my door. Um, and suddenly it went from me just knowing some poor saps on the internet that I agreed with to finding people I can go to the pub with and then organise stuff with. Um, and that's really great. You know, I don't want to... They forced us all to spend years in our houses like caught on the internet and the internet's like a really useful tool for doing other stuff but it's got to remain a tool and it's got to be um it's just got to be more secondary in our lives we got to go back to finding um people around us that are going to get us through because if shit does hit the fan i'm not so certain that it's going to be this enormous mega collapse that preppers would warn you about but it's it's certainly still worth knowing everyone in the local area that might be useful. I agree with you. I mean, I do think that some prep is necessary, especially on the financial side, because I do think that the collapse of fiat money in particular is inevitable. But when it comes to other aspects, um, I actually think that the state is just going to go into a gradual state of more and more um, irrelevancy. You know, as people just kind of look at it, they're going to look at the system and just say, this just doesn't make any sense. You know, we're being lied to every day. You know, the media is a joke. I mean, just little things like, I don't know if you saw recently that like Sesame Street, Sesame Street is all over the vaccine thing. They're, they're pushing it 
like more than anyone. I've seen more bloody stuff from Sesame Street than I have from the NHS trying to push this stuff. And um, they're, 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 they've got literally, a, I don't even know what you call it, is it a puppet, whatever the hell that, that thing is. They've got a puppet telling you to go and take a vaccine. It's like, if you can't look at this and just be like, you know, we are literally just living in clown world. It's becoming more and more obvious. And I do think that eventually, similar to the collapse of Rome, if you ever kind of um, looked into when Rome collapsed, it was almost like Rome, nobody quite knew exactly when the Roman Empire ended. It was almost just like this long period that was drawn out over, I think it was hundreds of years, um, where it just kind of gradually lost more and more legitimacy and it still claimed to have legitimacy, but everyone just kind of moved on and they were doing their own thing. They were kind of just ignoring the the Roman Empire and the emperor, etc. But theoretically, it was still in existence. And I think that's what we're kind of going to, we're going to go towards is just that people start doing their own things. They're going to form their own communities. We're going to have some kind of parallel economy. Eventually, when everyone realizes that it's no fun just having a probe stuck up your nose, you know, to go to the pub or whatever and having to take a vaccine every three months or whatever, eventually everyone's going to be like, actually, I don't want to live like this. They're going to kind of move more over on to the freedom side, which we will probably at that point say, well, you know, we're never going to go to a pub that requires a vaccine passport. So we're going to be maybe doing things like speakeasies or, you know, getting together and and doing things in our house that we'll probably share on social media and telegram groups. And eventually that will become more dominant and uh, people will realize, okay, like there's just always ways to work outside of the system, especially with um, social media and things like that. So, and then eventually that will just become the norm and the, the state just fades into more and more irrelevancy until either these things are dropped or no one abides by them and they're just kind of you know these rules that you read about kind of like these laws that have gone by you know you you can read about these laws that they became laws like hundreds of years ago and they were never quite revoked like but they're really crazy like i read about one that was something like if you're if you're a scotsman you can legally like fire a crossbow across the street and do this out there it was some crazy law that apparently has never been fully revoked but now we just kind of laugh and joke about it and maybe that's where all of the covid rules are going to go it's like nobody abides by them nobody cares we're just living our lives but the state is there in the background probably still saying oh take your 87th booster or the you know alpha omega whatever variant is going to come and get you and everyone's just like okay we're, we're kind of done done with this and and hopefully that's we're on a path to that already that's a really interesting observation because i was streaming for all of 2020 i did a daily live stream as this was all kicking off i think i started doing it before covid was announced so i would be looking at what the latest announcements from the government were and interpreting them or reinterpreting them trying to figure out what was actually going on and then it hit a point where it's like i'm i'm not doing this anymore because what am i going to get out of them like my life cannot even if i'm here to tell you why it's a lie and what the truth really is there's just no benefit in me listening to what these people are telling us to be scared of. All I'm going to do is tell you not to be scared of it. Um, and so eventually I just stopped getting, I, I was still doing the streams, but I stopped getting the daily updates from the government, which as a news stream is kind of supposed to be the first thing on your desk. But um, I was moving in that direction where it's like, okay, if you're asleep, then you believe it. If you're awake, then you um, then you reject it. But really, you have to ignore it and certainly not react against it. So um, it, it's funny because it overlaps with like, oh, is protesting pointless? And I certainly don't believe protesting is pointless. But there was one time I went down to Parliament Square on a Wednesday to do some filming. And there were some guys there with pots and pans just and um, megaphones and like some air horns and they were bashing them and making a load of noise. Um, and I asked them what was going on and they told me some new noise restrictions had been introduced that day. So they weren't allowed to do what they were currently doing in that exact spot. Right. So they were breaking those rules that had only been brought in that day. And I just thought that was the, the best example of like wasted energy. You should be, ignoring this whole situation why have you come here to break rules that both sides agree are pointless because you wouldn't have been there um in any other situation but now they put the rules in you're breaking them on purpose do you see what i mean that that's just a waste of time compared to just ignoring it and getting on with your own life i don't know i, I mean 
I, I think that's kind of funny, actually. Like, just it was just funny. Great role. I mean, they, like, I, I was listening to something the other day. Who was basically saying, you know, when you go into the supermarket and there's always these uh, these like marks on the floor, and I'm like this as well. But I was listening to uh, what he was saying. I think it was on a podcast. It was um, oh, I, I can't remember the name of it right now. But anyway, if, if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes. But he um, <laughs> he was saying like when he sees those marks on the floor when you're queuing for the cashiers and stuff, he was like. I'm just never standing on the mark. He was like, I'm standing as far away from those dots. I'm standing between the dots deliberately so that I'm not abiding. And he was like, it's no harm. Like normally if the dots weren't there, he would stand that distance anyway. But just because the dots are there, he's like, I'm standing between them. And I thought that is exactly how I feel. Like if someone makes a stupid rule, I'm just inclined to not do it just to make a point of it. And maybe that's irrational and I haven't quite rationalized whether that's a good form of activism in any kind of way, but it feels, it feels okay to me. It feels like, like the right thing to do. No, I think that's a good idea. I've got a friend who I went to the pub with him a few times in the summer. I got to know him through this. I met him at a protest and, um, He'll take the piss out of every rule going. But the the best one was there was some pub that we were in that had a one-way system to get to the toilet and it had that yellow and black arrows on the floor. And um, so he just walked the wrong way, obviously. And a barmaid came to like correct him and go, oh, sir, sir, you have to go this way. And he, he turned around and went, I'm sorry. And she explained the one-way system and he just went, oh, and sort of acted a bit thick and kept walking and just pretended that he was too stupid to understand. And no matter how hard she tried to get him to walk the right way, he kept walking the wrong way um, because he was, he was committed. I'm not, I'm not going to walk the right way. And, you know, that's, that certainly helps to beat the system. If we can just grind the jobs worth down, it's like, yeah, you know, that's exactly it. Yeah. Make your job kind of annoying until you can't be asked to do it anymore um, and to have fun with it. As long as you're having fun with whatever you do to, to piss off the system, then I think we're basically winning. I like just having a loud conversation about how it's all bollocks when I'm in the pub. I like just being a bit louder than I normally would to see if yeah. other people um, react <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I definitely feel like uh, this conversation, we've we've been much more positive than our, our last one. And we are making light of the situation more, which is what I hope a lot more people are doing. Now, anyway, let's uh, just get on a little bit. I didn't give you like a full introduction. We kind of got straight into it. So tell us a little bit about Scum Media. Cool. Well, yeah, I was running everything that I did was under the name Unwashed before, and that was focused on kind of anything politically that I disagreed with. Let the cultural Marxism, aka wokeness, was sort of the main thrust of it. And then Scandemic came along, and by 2021, or I suppose by the Trafalgar Square protests of 2020, it was clear to me that there was there was a movement here. Um, it's not just facts and information. There's a whole network. Um, you know, they organized all the speeches um, at Trafalgar Square and each of those people speaking had their own audience that was really, um, really impassioned about them. And when the protests kicked off at the beginning of 2021, when we kind of came out of winter into spring, there were three in a row that were wonderful. There was such a great energy at them. And um, I filmed them with some friends. And I basically just kept filming anything I can, which is attached to the freedom movement this year, um, because there's been a complete media blackout on it. And the, on Telegram, there's there's a kind of oversaturation of truth information. If you want to find the truth, you can find it a hundred times over. Um, and what I really wanted to do was just uh, film the people, like a big, big range of people. Um, and, and that also makes YouTube censorship so interesting because I keep getting, you know, banned from every platform. And all I'm really doing now is going down to, london when there's something on and asking the public what they think and i'm getting banned from everything for that it's not even my opinion anymore i barely put out what i think um so part of it was about showing off that there's hundreds of people that feel this way 
And each of them might be an expert on something esoteric that you might not have thought about, like 5G or 5D or any of these weird concepts. Um, but there are also like legends among it. So Piers Corbin was working flat out for the last two years. So we interviewed him and um and because I thought it was worth a full hour. Uh Reverend Jamie Franklin, who's the host of the Irreverend podcast, that's been an amazing resource um, for people throughout lockdown. And I've just been trying to find names like this who've, who've stood up, who've done a little bit more, and um, just shine a light on them and do the kind of do the kind of work that journalists should be doing. I have no background in this kind of stuff at all, and I'm looking around flabbergasted, like where the hell is everyone. I had friends that did journalism degrees. And at the moment, it's on me to go out and interview someone who's been injured by the vaccine and tell her story. It's like, that should be Louis Theroux's job. So mm -hmm. why isn't that happening? And, and the worm is eventually going to turn. And people are going to ask questions about why those stories weren't being told. Um, like we interviewed Bob Moran on Friday, who I know that you're you're going to be familiar with from Twitter, right? I love Bob Moran, yeah. Yeah, he's so poignant and eloquent with his tweets, and the cartoons are just fantastic. And um, and yeah, the way he phrased it um, was that the decision to lock down the country is condemning a certain number of people to death. A certain number of people are going to die off the back of that decision. All COVID stuff is based on modelling, but by doing that, by shutting down the economy, by preventing people from doing X, Y, and Z, there's a death count attached to that. And, you know, I'm looking at the entire media profession and going, when are you going to lift that lid? By this point, there's a lot of people dead from a lot of different causes and a lot of lives ruined. So... Uh, I mean, not to toot my own horns, scum is just me and my phone, like figuring out a way through this. But, um, you know, the media has a responsibility to tell this stuff. And if they're not gonna, I'll, I'll do a little bit of it. And um, also shouts to like Resistance GB have been doing um, loads and loads of coverage of the protests as well. Uh, Unity News Network and UK Column. So it's not like it's just me. But, um, and actually, fair play to GB News for always putting Neil Oliver um, front and centre and, you know, giving us some truth. It does, it, you know, it's a hell of a lot better than the BBC. It's a hell of a lot better than um, talk radio as well, which was kind of what everyone was listening to before the GB News basically just took the best people from talk radio and just did their own thing, right? Yeah, and um, it's interesting to see where they draw the line. Um, do you, yeah, do you think GB News allows for more than talk radio? Yeah, far more. I, I I think GB News is basically like talk radio, but less censored, and you know, with more intelligent people there. I mean, yeah, I, I don't really know. Talk radio, in my opinion, is going to really have to stop. Um, you know, being total vax peddlers if they actually want to be able to compete, because at least GB News will talk about things like that and will will be vocally, um, you know both anti-mandate, um, anti-kind of vax passports, and also even just talking about things like the side effects. Like, I've never heard talk radio really talk much about that, if at all. No, and they must be subject to different rules as well, because I'm, I'm sure that um, this is all based on what the Ofcom rules are, right? And, and they use that as an excuse um, to get out of this kind of questioning. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. The British public have a right to know and they have a responsibility to tell us in the media. Um, but clearly the system is set up in this way where if they were to report on the negative effects of, a, I guess, any government policy, um, with relation to COVID at least, then, I don't know, there must be some legal precedent for them not being allowed to do that. And um, it must be slightly 
looser at GB News because that's going to determine their audience as well. The more they cover this kind of stuff, the more GB News is going to grow. It is as simple as that. Every time they have someone who's giving the other side um, and believes that we need to do something about climate change or the lockdown wasn't that bad or the mandatory vaccinations for care workers is a sensible move, you know, everyone hates it. That Their entire audience is against that. And doing things in the interest of fairness and balance. Like, well, if the BBC is never going to do that, then I don't really see why why they should have to toe the line carefully. So, yeah, I just hope Neil Oliver and co. get louder and more popular because I can't see why he wouldn't. People love him. Yeah, everyone does love him. I think at um, GB News having Neil Oliver is just an absolute winning move. Like, the speeches that he does, he's just so eloquent. And I really think that years from now 50 years from now you can almost just take neil oliver speeches and you you know you've you've charted the whole um period the whole kind of corona hysteria period through his words and it would be you almost just couldn't um add or remove a single word from what he says it's just the perfect summary of everything that's going on and i think he speaks for a lot of people so yeah props to neil oliver i hope i get to speak to him one day any other thoughts that you want to share i guess really I'm interested to know what you think that we can all be doing. You mentioned to me before we started the show about Jacked, which I thought sounded like a really cool idea. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about that and then other things that people can be doing to try to kind of um, live uh, normally and live a more free life with everything that's going on in the world right now. Well, the word normal is really, really appropriate there because before I did all of this crap, um, before I became a full-time extremist for freedom, uh, I was a DJ and I stopped doing that. And I was kind of ready to pack that in and leave it as part of my 20s because it's quite a um, it's a very draining life having to stay up till 4 a.m. Um, surrounded by people who are off their faces. Um, and so 10 years of it was sort of, I was I was ready to go do something else. Um, but after two years of having no opportunity to do that, even if I wanted to, um, I understand that what that was was actually kind of valuable. Um, it, it was a worthwhile use of my 20s. It wasn't just completely frivolous. As soon as they decided this is not essential, I was kind of like, fuck you, that was essential. I made people happy. Fuck you. I'm, I'm going to do this again. So I've um, I booked a night in a pub uh, and it's near me and it's and the night's called Jacked, which has a big Union Jack across it. And that's a sort of pun to do with house music uh, that hopefully one or two people will get. But basically, it was just an opportunity for me to DJ. But also it's a meet meet up for anyone who's um you know, against what's been going on. So I'm going to have to get in touch with the Together Declaration and to say, look, I want to, I want to use your brand on all my events because I, this is the point of it. Rather than being like, oh, I'm a dubstep night or an electro night, it's we stand against vaccine passports. We will never discriminate. And we are strictly using venues and artists who feel the same way as us and have been vocal about it. So I'm hoping it's a good opportunity to bring people together um, who feel the same way because we all need to meet each other. And that's that's the thing that has made my year is going to so many protests and initiatives with other people who are A, awake and B, want to do something about it because there are a lot of people that are awake that aren't, aren't proactive. Um, and, you know, every. every everyone's going to do what they're going to do, but I prefer being with the proactive people. Um, So number one, it's a way of getting them together. Number two, it's a way of supporting artists and venues that are willing to put their head above the parapet because it's really brave to do that. You will, I've seen people do it and they um, receive a lot of slander. They might get bookings dropped and all sorts of stuff might end up on a blacklist because this is how malicious people are. So they deserve our support. Um, and there, there's actually some really good rappers and stuff that I'm really looking forward to hosting. And it, it, you know, it just works as like, okay, cool. There's something that I can build, which is on the other side of this, um, which is not conforming to anything that they want. And I can't really see a negative side to it. And the, I, I guess the main bit to tie it all up is that it's exactly what I was doing before. 
And that's why it's normal. It's like there is zero difference between what I was doing in my 20s and what I'm doing now, except it's just tied to the freedom movement now. We don't even we don't have to be particularly loud and political about it. We just do it. Just do it with a little hint that it's, you know, for us. I'd like to get everyone who comes along to sign the Together Declaration on entry or at least ask them to uh, so that it pushes people in the right direction. And maybe if it gets big enough, it could attract artists to say the right thing. It's like, hey, do you want to play for us? Well, you've got to say on a video that you stand against vaccine passports, but hey, then we'll give you a crowd. Um, so that's my goal for 2022. And it should be a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really strong idea. I, I definitely think that we've just got to do more to try to support each other. People who are against this stuff need to actually come together and say, look, um, we're going to build something different and we're going to, you know, stick to our values and our principles. And, you know, if that means that I'm going to go to a gig um, for someone who I don't even care that much for their music, but they're against all this stuff, then I'm going to do it. You know, like um, there's plenty of musicians out there who I don't necessarily um that their music isn't necessarily exactly my kind of thing but if they were playing i'd probably go there because i'd be like i want to support this person who has really kind of like you know stood by their morals and are doing the right thing and i think that's you know at the end of the day if you got a lot of people in that environment together who have the same ideas it would be a great vibe like people who just agree with these fundamental ideas of freedom and fairness and um you know things like bodily autonomy etc like these are just they're very basic things, but it does seem like everyone that I'm communicating with in this community is just very, very easy to get along with. And, you know, everyone I've kind of spoken to, I've been like, oh, yeah, this is, um, you know, not saying that I'm a, a particularly disagreeable p- person in, in, in a sense that, like, I don't get along with most people. But certainly within this community, I find that everyone, as long as you have that base understanding, as we all do, of freedom, etc., you can just have, like, really good conversations. And uh, we just seem to have a lot of mutual respect for each other. So this is something that I'm trying to promote as well. It's just that we need to form these communities and just say, look, it doesn't matter whether you've met someone or how much time you spent with this person or whatever. If you know that we share these um, similar ideas, get together with those people, have meetups, do all of these things. It's just super important that we kind of like um, get together and we kind of do what we can to uh, build an alternative community, essentially, and essentially get this kind of counterculture, which I think it is, really get it off the ground and, and let's let's get it going mainstream. Yeah, I I used to have a big long list of like friends and acquaintances. And now I feel like it's not it's not the same thing. It's much more like probably sounds a bit I don't know, woo-woo, but it's more like a soul tribe where there's people that I've only been talking to a couple of weeks and it'll make me believe in past lives because I'm like the, the click I have with you is as if it's from before. It's as if we've picked up where I've left off before. Um, that That's how it feels now. Because, and I think it's the urgency that's doing that. I, I notice that when I meet up with stand in the park people or people at a protest, five minutes, I can be having the deepest, most mind-blowing conversation about anything um, with anyone of any age as well. But compare that to, I went to a gig um, that I bought tickets to like two years ago um, and it had been delayed for the whole time. And the gig finally happened uh, somewhere in London. So I went along to that and, uh, you know, I've, I've got no trouble fitting in in a normal place, but I felt kind of like an outsider or like I had a secret under my hat or something it was very very strange and it might be because i'd spent so much time in those other circles and other environments where you can be completely open that it was kind of weird and i didn't really want to go back and this is what i've said to other dj friends who are awake in this thing or musicians that i've met it's like do you want to go back to old clubs and gigs because we can I can go back to everything that I've been complaining about missing. And I don't really have that urge to. I don't want to go back to the festivals that I might have used to buy tickets to. I just want to get on and be on the other side where I'm not a consumer. I'm helping to build it and helping to pull the whole thing off. I would just much rather spend my time trying to be productive with other people um, that are trying to build something. Because we know that's what needs to happen, right? 
we know we're not reverting back to um, whatever happened before, so we better get a move on now. Totally agree, man. Well, thanks a lot for the conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, man. It's been a, been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me.